Something about stepping aboard a train for a long journey. Of course, there's the anticipation of reaching your destination, but there's also a sense of apprehension about what might happen on the way. A train journey is an adventure. You enter a small world, a traveling island. You're bundled in with a group of total strangers heading off to remote and distant locations. This evening, we begin a five-part series on great railway journeys of Australia. Five adventures down twin ribbons of steel through all corners of our continent. In this first program, we travel to the very heart, the Alice. We recall the most romantic of all railway journeys, the GAN. And we explore today's equivalent, our new link with the Outback. If you're a lover of trains, or well, just think that maybe one day a train ride would be a good way to have a look around, I think you'll enjoy this. <laughs>
A four hour long ritual is over. It's one which has been practiced around the world for up to 150 years. Carefully building a full head of steam. Appreciating the need to pamper a little to get full power later. Whether you are going to another state or another suburb, the firing up of a steam loco was the first step. So now that old steam locos like this W class have made way for diesel power, a way of life has changed. But diesel power has also done us a favour. It's confirmed that the real romance of railways was in the era it replaced. They were the days when riding the rails was an adventure. Village of Progress, ready to leave on its first trip to Albury on November 23rd, 1937. Another innovation in Australian railway travel was the appointment of a stewardess to provide all comfort services to women and children. The driver gives the motion gear a final drop of oil, the whistle sounds, the throttle is opened, and the train is off and the never-ending task of firing starts in earnest. riding qualities of this train have to be experienced to be appreciated. The Streamline Blue and Gold Express provides an impressive spectacle when it is speeding non-stop between Melbourne and Albury with its large complement of passengers. Note how the smoke from the locomotive is deflected upwards. This train is but another example of the ever-improving service which the Victorian railways are offering to their patrons. Spirit of progress, and no finer name could have been found for the pride of the Victorian railways, the greyhound of the tracks, and the last word in train construction in the southern hemisphere. By the late 60s, the transition was complete. What had been the last word in train construction in the southern hemisphere gave way to huge diesels. Glistening stainless steel carriages were added, and another era on the rails around Australia was born. Today, most of the leftovers are nothing more than memorials to their own demise. The Flinders Ranges of mid-northeast South Australia were the cradle of the GAN. And if ever there had been an ultimate train adventure on the rails around Australia, the Gans of yesteryear would have won first prize. Until the age of stainless steel took over the trip in 1980, it had always been imbued with a special character. Passengers loved the challenge of the Gan and its unpredictability. It was accepted that travelling on it was better than arriving in either its first destination at Udnadatta or later at Alice Springs. The GAN was something of a matriarch, unique amongst other trains and a monument to Australia's pioneering history, a train which opened up the outback. The name derived from an occasion in August 1923 when an Afghan passenger at dusk on the arrival of the train uh, disembarked and went to a quiet corner of the yard to say his evening prayers. A railway man jokingly made a remark that we ought to call it the Afghan Express. And the train got its name, then the GAN Express, and over the years, the GAN. It gave birth to several trains also called the GAN. And then, a few years ago, the new GAN. That in turn gave birth to the Alice, a once a week service to Alice Springs from Sydney Railway Station. It's a building which still embodies the feel that was the steam era. Its role then was as the hub of a transport system developed around the train. Yet they were days when meeting under the station clock was as ritualised and hassle free as firing up the steam locos. By contrast, the new GAN 
leaves from the small but ultra-modern Keswick railway station, which seems to be divorced not only from the period which spawned the GAN, but from the railways in general. Far from being the hub of a transport system, it seems determined to keep pace with airport styling. It's the tenant of an area far better known in Adelaide as a huge goods yard, not as the terminus of the city's interstate trains. At the start of their journeys, the Gann and the Alice are roughly 1,200 kilometres apart. But a day from Sydney and a few hours north of Adelaide, they'll share the same track, destination and virtually the same identity. It's almost as though Sydney saw the success of the Gann and decided to clone it. And while the Alice doesn't have the airport styling on Platform 1 at Sydney Railway Station, since its inaugural trip in 1983, it has rarely travelled less than 85% full. Once out of suburbia, it's the Alice which has the more interesting route, made largely so by a series of ten tunnels through the Blue Mountains, which the drivers of steam dubbed the Rat Holes. Electrification of the line in 1957 certainly made the job of driving a train through the mountains to Lithgow easier than in the days when as many as four steam locos may have been used for the same job. The 160 kilometres from Sydney to Lithgow has taken two hours and 40 minutes. It's late afternoon and time to change from electric power to diesel. What first appears as though it could be a rather frustrating affair is done with practiced ease so the train can take off down the other side of the mountains. We're now 26 hours from Sydney. Port Pirie in the mid-north of South Australia is approximately the halfway point in the journey. It's become important to the Alice as a place where it can restock for the leg north and where the South Australian crew takes over from their New South Wales counterparts.
While neither group would admit it, the Alice has introduced a degree of competition, Australian National versus the New South Wales State Rail Authority. Simmering underneath is the need to have one central body in charge of the national railways. In the past, passengers from Sydney to Alice Springs had to travel via Adelaide. Now the Alice has eliminated the extra distance, but past Port Pirie shares the track with the GAN. In turn, this line has long since bypassed the route forged by steam power. It's the original route through the Flinders Ranges and Udna Data, which won't be forgotten thanks to a group of enthusiasts calling themselves the Pitchy Ritchie Steam Preservation Society. The society took up the challenge to keep steam alive on the historic narrow gauge track through Pitchy Ritchie Pass. The Pitchy Ritchie line was originally started as the Government Gums Railway in 1877 and the construction continued through 1878 to 79 when the train reached uh, Corn and eventually in 1891 the line reached Udnadatta. But the plan was the Great Northern Railway to go right through to Darwin. This never eventuated and took until 1926 when the Commonwealth Railways took over the operation of the line and extended it as far as Alice Springs, its current terminus. These ruins are the only remnants of the township of Pitchy Ritchie, which existed long before the railway. It was the overnight stop for bullock wagons and travellers from Port Augusta. When the railway first came through here, the trains ran only once every two weeks, stopping overnight at various townships, so the passengers could sleep in a hotel, then continue their journey the next day. That was presuming the train hadn't broken down or come off the tracks. Its record wasn't exactly unblemished, and even now history sometimes repeats itself. For these dedicated steam lovers, derailments are embarrassing and of nuisance value at least. I must admit, I threw it over pretty quickly, but yeah. I, I looked at them and then looked at the other one. I looked at them, thought they were all right, but I suspect that that must have been off through, and there was nothing holding them. They would... Points weren't quite set, so there's a little bit of gap on both sides. And uh, one time wheel gets in through the gap, uh, and it goes the wrong way, and then you get a bit of weight on it, and then the points come back the right place, and the next set of wheels go the other way. And just when you've got the same vehicle trying to go in two directions, it might, something's going to give sooner or later. And uh, that's when it falls off the track. Well, all we did was put those plates in. There's uh, fish, fish plates and, and up on timber wedges and wedge, wedge them up under the rail so that the, right, the, the wheels would actually roll up the wedge up to the top of the track level again and then if you go far enough, once you, you, you flange just get up on the, on the top of the rail, they just keep on rolling along and eventually drop back into place. These enthusiasts have only 40 kilometres of track to play with, but the Pitchy Ritchie Railway operates according to established uh, railway procedure. Welcome to Pitchy Ritchie Railway. With just a hint of uh, bureaucracy. One or two things that I must announce. Please uh, do not smoke on the carriages. You may stand on the platform steps, uh, on the, the platform, but not on the steps. Please don't stand on the steps. Children, may stand on the platform, but only if accompanied by an adult. The society comprises people from all walks of life. We have doctors, 
school teachers, railway men of all types, those that drive diesel locomotives and want to relive the pleasures of driving the old steam locomotive. People from other professions learn uh, and study and must be qualified by railway rules before they're allowed to perform any task. Other professions presumably embraces wives and girlfriends who were faced with a beat them or join them decision. It led to an infusion of women like Meg Atkins to stoke the fires. Well, it all started as a joke because I got tired of doing the usual female things of looking after food and selling tickets to the souvenirs. And having been on the engine once or twice, I enjoyed it so much that I didn't want to get off it. And so I kept on going and did the necessary exams, the necessary training. It is hard work, uh, but you do develop a knack. And if it's too hard, well, you just don't do it. Uh, you have to do the job. Clear this side, Brian. Uh, you have to do the job. You can't plead that you're a weak woman and uh, that you can't do it. If you take on the job, you have to do it. Well, we start our people off as a, as a trainee fireman. And they go out with a fireman and start to learn the ropes. I guess in the old days they would have called them a cleaner, but we call them a trainee fireman because they do a bit more than just cleaning locos. They come out and learn how to fire and so on. Then after that they graduate to a fireman, they pass their relevant examinations, got en enough hours of experience. And then when the, the opportunity arises, we'll then transfer them into being a trainee driver. And they'll come over this side of the footplate with the driver and learn the techniques of driving and how to look after the engines and so on. And Nobody has ever said to me, you can't do that because you're a woman. Uh, they tease the living daylights out of you, of course. Yes, you do. Uh, but you get used to that and you have to... Uh, that's, uh, that's part of being equal. And you have to learn to, to take it and you have to learn to tease them back. Uh, but... Uh, while they started off teasing us because we were female, they now tease us for other reasons. It's like some of us have got hot tempers and things like that, but, uh, and we tend to get teased about that sort of thing. But, uh, we think we've trained them very well, but we don't like to tell them that. No, oh, that's OK. Uh, if they do a good job, you can give them a kiss without them people thinking you're a bit odd. When rumours spread in the early 1970s that the old Pitchy Ritchie line was to be ripped up and sold for scrap, locals in the town of Corn began lobbying for its preservation, or more precisely, preservation of all the stone bridges and viaducts which were built by interlocking the stones without using any mortar at all. They won the battle and began the rebirth of the Pitchy Ritchie Railway, a railway which has been the foundation of all lines north and west in Australia. In fact, the town of Quorn was expected to fulfil a long-standing prophecy that it would be the most important railway town in Australia. The volunteer rituals of today are just an echo of the wartime period, when one shunter handled a dozen trains per shift, and often 40 trains went through Quorn Station each day. From the time the first sod was turned in 1878, this railway was intended to be a key to annexation of the Northern Territory by South Australia. It was touted as the great connection to Darwin, and hence the Asian world. They even called it the Great Northern Railway. Mind you, the route through the Flinders Ranges was by no means the most direct they could have taken. Ostensibly, the railway was built as a service to people pioneering the area. But agitation for it came from copper miners and prominent pastoralists, which is most likely the reason it took the back-breaking route through the ranges and within a stone's throw of certain properties. Still by 1881, the line was through to a place called Beltana. Today, Beltana is all but forgotten. The railway station is a shop for tourists, and the trappings of its former status are barely discernible. The old freight shed stands idle, a far cry from its heyday a century ago, when the town was a base for development of the line. A thousand construction navvies invaded it, offering profits on one hand and violence on the other.
Settlers demanded that a police station and lockup be built. It was soon in constant use because the hotels in the town were well patronised. Disturbing the peace and rowdyism were common. The townsfolk were also worried by large-scale desertions from the gangs of navvies. Some simply walked off the job and disappeared. Others returned after a few days, and many lurked in the bush outside Beltana and raided stores and homes for food and money. If violence and intimidation weren't enough for the settlers, death from sickness and accident was prevalent. Beltana represented a period when many navvies and railway workers died or were killed near the railway line. Death was often the price to pay in developing the outback, not only with the railway, but earlier with the overland telegraph. For most of the time, it was no more than a torturous slog. Cuttings like this one were dug by hand. Concrete for bridges and culverts was mixed by hand. Extra ballast in the form of stones was collected by Afghan workers and left in piles for the navvies to pick up. How futile it would all seem to those men now that the rails have long since been removed and the few reminders left to rot in the searing heat. How many navvies must have pondered the need to battle the Flinders Rangers as they laboured here to give the train a free run back down to the plains where common sense has put the line today. When the route of the GAN was repositioned for the third time in 1980, it was even further west. It marked the beginning of a single gauge overnight trip to Alice Springs from Adelaide and sowed the seeds of the Alice from Sydney. It was something the drivers more than anyone appreciated. The last scan was uh, a hard train to work and it's part of history that's gone down and uh, we've uh, had to uh, go into a new phase of railway working to uh, work uh, trains at higher speed and uh, get a better service for the public. Gone was the narrow gauge track which used to cause them nightmares, but gone too was the adventure of changing trains by moonlight in the remote town of Maree. This midnight madness was the classic result of illogical planning, which left Australia split by different size gauges on all major lines. In fairness, passengers on the old GAN regarded it as part of their adventure into the outback, a rather comfortable way of later suggesting they'd roughed it in the desert of northern South Australia. For the conductors, it was a necessary evil, which must have cost and lost the railways an absolute fortune. Even the last minute repairs to the narrow gauge train they called the real GAN were part of the journey. Well, we have a rusted train pipe here and uh, we've had to replace it. And we've also had to re-thread the, uh, the other piece which joins it, of course. That happened in the derailment, did it? Yeah, it happened as a result of the derailment up at Warren or up the road there. Yeah, very bad? Yeah, pretty bad. Four coaches, they were always a problem. They're heavy, of course. Each trip was different. No one knew what to expect beyond the darkness of the desert in view of stories about the battering the old GAN had taken over the years from derailments and flash floods. When it moved off, it was always with respect for its age and the condition of the track. At this stage of the journey on the old GAN, there were no strangers. A kinship which most passengers had anticipated anyway, developed. It was as though members of a GAN-loving cult had come together to make sure its traditions continued through its last months of operation. The designers of the German-made club car with its polished walnut walls originally designated the three sections of the car for music, smoking and ladies. Yet apart from the piano being the centerpiece, any divisions were imagined. Passengers were always on the move, joining in wherever they could, adding to the gregarious spirit. On 
the new GAN, people appear to try to enjoy themselves harder. The spontaneity seems so much more contrived that you start looking for reasons. One might be that the broad base of age groups obvious on the old GAN has gone, or that in an overnight trip, there's simply no time to make an effort. The distinction between old and new GANs is as clear as that between first class and sit-ups on the modern train. When you have to sit for 20 hours without club car service, the bar seems to close every time you're thirsty. But a wise person makes sure they'll see the night through or find a way to ease the struggle. It's impossible to escape the irony that on the new GAN, it was mainly older people singing old songs, while on the old GAN, it was mainly young adventurers singing new songs. There were times on the old GAN when each of the passengers felt it was a train that could maintain its battle with the desert. In fact, towards the end, track restrictions reduced the gate of the old GAN to a crawl. No orders came through to fix the line to a reasonable standard because somehow the train seemed to make it slightly more often than it didn't. But finally and sadly, it existed only to await its death knell. At places like Edwards Creek on the old GAN, passengers had the chance to get out when the train stopped. Ladies and gentlemen, the next stop is Edwards Creek where the train takes on water. They leave the train for a few minutes while they're watering the cars, but don't wander too far away from the train. Despite the heat and warnings, they seemed compelled to wander, wanting to soak up the remoteness or trying to imagine what Edwards Creek was like in the days when it was an important fettlers camp and locomotive depot. If one thing has been common to all GANs, it's been the need to take on water in an uncompromising desert. From Edwards Creek, the line was serviced for miles in either direction, replacing sleepers or sections of line when necessary, even fighting the odd plague of grasshoppers and ants which infested the tracks. It's not hard to understand why, in the days before the new GAN, this area was known as the land plenty of time and wait a bit. The old single loco took a good kilometre or two to get the train wound up. And even then, the fastest it travelled was 40 kilometres an hour. It could never be said that the route of the old GAN was endowed with scenic splendour. The Algie Buckner Bridge over the Niels River was a highlight. But it was clear as soon as track laying machinery was on the move to build the new line, roughly 150 kilometres west, that a special era was closing.
Not only were there the sounds of new technology, but the rail was being welded together in one continuous piece to take away the familiar clickety-clack of bolted track. In the remoteness of the desert, the new line for the GAN and subsequently the Alice remained clear of governments, unions and protest groups. It finished well within budget and a year ahead of schedule at the rate of five kilometres a week. The only reminder of what was a mammoth track laying job is the Iron Man sculpture. A Rodin masterpiece it's not, but the train slows to show respect for the symbol which stands opposite the one millionth sleeper on the new line. Yet history will no doubt record the new bridge across the Fink River further north as a more significant monument. It's taken away the Russian roulette aspect of rail travel to Alice Springs and become a counter to the Fink's flooding tantrums. It's hard to believe that in 1980 this was the main line north and the track across the Fink. No wonder track inspectors used to regard it as not a day-by-day -day proposition but hour by hour. Over the years, the strategy here remained simple. When the line washed away, it was replaced. The river silt quickly hid any evidence that outback rivers can turn into torrents with little warning. The open stretches of sand at both the old crossing and the new don't even suggest a river. So the decision by the original surveyors to lay the track direct onto what they presumed was parched desert ground seems reasonable. the thought of flooding must have been their last consideration. Yet in 1968, the Fink flooded four times in the one season. It's capable of depths over five metres, but can go for 15 years or more without any water in it. On occasions when the river was in flood like that, the crew would test the water by either walking across, probing with a stick, or by climbing onto a fettler's trolley and measuring the depth as they went. If the water was less than two feet deep, it meant the locomotive could cope because the boilers were above that level. So unless the lines had been washed away, the train could proceed within a reasonable time of the flood passing. Not so with diesel engines. They could handle only three inches of water over the track so it was common for train loads of passengers to remain stranded in the outback for days and weeks on end. In later years, they were airlifted out. On one occasion, the GAN drew into Alice Springs railway station at the appointed time in the morning. It just happened that it was three months late. Early the morning after leaving Adelaide, the new GAN heads into the McDonnell Ranges and towards civilization. It's the moment in the last few kilometres when people on the train are keen to voice their assessments and opinions. We've always gone by coach everywhere we've been, we've and this is our longest train trip. And this has really surprised me. Yeah. The fruits are excellent. Yes, food. you could know. There's no that. shortage of food, it's real good. The top bunks <laughs> are not comfortable. You feel as though you're a bottle full of uh, soapy water being shaken around. I couldn't get a cup of tea unless I walked the entire length of the train. True? Yes. A lot of little old ladies like a cup of tea. They don't want anything stronger. So they walk. Only complain. Well, entertainment's good. Make your own entertainment and join in and we're happy. <laughs> It's very good, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. really good. Yeah. Very good. It surprised me, really. Yeah. Yes, we'd do it again. Uh, Wouldn't we? Would yeah, we do it again? certainly I would. Yeah, I would. Yeah. It was good. Brian and Vera have made the trip to Alice Springs their own. They've lost count of the number of times they've passed through Heavy Tree Gap, gateway to the desert centre. And they'll add another to their list in a few hours' time when the train heads back south. Well, you're getting there so quickly with this one, you know, your trip's over so quickly. Whereas the old GAN, you had a couple of days and it was, uh, well, we just thoroughly enjoyed it. These days you can travel in a train like this to the Indian Pacific, to from Sydney to Perth, 
or perhaps the Alice from Sydney to Alice Springs, or over in the eastern states you've got the various trains there which are quite similar, but the old gown was just something different. It was old and it was a slower trip, more um, relaxed. relaxed, yes, and everybody was on a slow train and taking their time and thoroughly enjoying it. So the new GAN and the Alice make their trips infinitely faster than the train they replaced. The people of Alice Springs have even chipped in with a new station and a new building to cope with the more modern trains. Together they've removed all the uncomfortable moments. Why, if you were on the old GAN at the moment, you could be anywhere out in the vastness of the desert, still rattling and rolling your way north. Conductor Aspro Lyons, a legend in the railways, might have been navigating the corridors and checking on your general well-being. Good morning, dear. Did you have a nice sleep? Yes. Good morning, dear. Did you have a nice sleep? While up front, the drivers had plenty of time to boil up a brew. Breakfast might have been cooking while the crew got into the mood for the day ahead. Then again, if the old GAN was having a good day, you might be just pulling into Udnadatta, the original terminus. used to be on the old uh, trains and the non-air conditioned days. Two taps, hot, cold. And then you just followed it away. Yeah. And close it. Yeah. And or Aspro, now content with the well-being of passengers, could have been showing you his train. Oh, well, they, they just pull down, isn't it? And they, they're made up in the morning. And then they just pull them down like this. Strangers would have become friends, encouraging you to lounge around and sing for a while. To get you off the track to Ella Springs. You can forget about a plane, they only go too fast. The only way to go is the one that gets there last. Now I'm talking about a train, and I'm talking about a track that runs from here to Ella Springs. I'm gonna get you back. Now I want it ain't no speedster, and it's not to flash or fine. It'll always take you some time a little bit further up the line. On the gas. If you want to see the land ride again, oh, it's a magic boomerang. It's a wonder if it makes it back again. On again, if you want to see the land ride again, oh, it's a magic boomerang. It's a wonder if it makes it back again. Heavy Tree Gap, where the old line simply faded into the sand by contrast with the sealed bitumen road, was still 24 hours away. There would have been no new station. And there would have been the awkward goodbyes that come from real friendship. Or well, someone said something stupid like, on the old GAN, it was better to journey than to arrive. 